So today my guest is Eleanor Goldfield. Eleanor is a filmmaker whose film Hard Road of Hope came across my radar and it's a very important story. I'm glad that you're you're telling it, that you've told it. Uh, but you're not just a filmmaker, you're a podcaster, you're a poet, a musician, journalist, creative, radical. So thanks for all those things. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for being here. Thank you. How are you? I'm hanging in there. How about you? Good. Uh, you know, all things considered, right? Yeah. Could be a shit ton worse. Yeah. Phew. So are you from West Virginia? Where are you from, Eleanor? What's your story? What's your background? I am not from West Virginia. Um, I am from, I'm partially from North Carolina and partially from Sweden. All right. Excellent. Well, what made you want to tell this story of coal miners and workers and citizens and what they're facing with these industries in West Virginia. What drew you to West Virginia in these people? Did you have any connection? Um, well, kind of. Uh, so I've, I've been doing frontline journalism work for basically since 2010 or so. Um, and I felt that it was very important when I could to get to the places where the story was happening because one of my biggest qualms, I have many, one of my biggest qualms with corporate media is that they'll just say shit that they have no proof of. Um, and they'll be like, I heard this from somebody, so it must be true. <laughs> um, and not only is that, you know, fake news, but it also silences the people who are on the front lines whose stories need to be told. So a lot of this really came into, uh, came into play because a lot of my work was supporting in frontline trainings and frontline blockades, either of pipelines or other dirty energy projects. So, you know, I'd go to places like Louisiana or Pennsylvania. Um, and so I first became interested in West Virginia as, uh, as, a, as a place of, you know, destruction at the hands of, uh, of both the coal companies, but also at the hands of oil and gas. And I thought this sort of shift that was happening was interesting from a very morbid perspective. Um, and I wanted to learn more about it. I also wanted to challenge something that I had heard growing up in North Carolina, which was, you know, oh, like things might be bad, but it's not West Virginia kind of thing. Like no. it was always the butt end of jokes. And um, for for uh, for like North Carolina, if you're the butt end of jokes, like something's gone really bad. <laughs> so I wanted to know like how bad could it really be? Um, yeah. And I mean, pretty much as soon as I got there, I realized that yes, West Virginia has been really since its founding a resource colony and home to all kinds of corporate malfeasance and industrial destruction and oppression of the people and communities there. But it's also an incredible story of radical organizing and solidarity uh, that doesn't get talked about at all. So I really felt like uh, th these stories needed to be told, not by me, but kind of through me. Um, I always feel like it's important to not tell people stories because, you know, it's not mine. You know, I don't, I'm not from West Virginia. So I wanted to make sure that there was space for these folks to tell those stories um, and to, you know, inspire other folks like around the, not just around the country, but, but outside of it as well. Like we all share this, this history of, uh, of being used by, you know, you being used for profit. Um, and there's a lot of space for solidarity there across industries, across cultures. Um, and West Virginia showed us how to do that. Yeah. I mean, one of the takeaways and, and the people, um, that you feature uh, are are great choices. I, I want to, um, you know, they're well versed, well spoken. They really fill in that history, um, and I want to get to, you know, how you found them um, in your journey. But I think um, by the end of the film, the question that I was asking myself, because uh, you know, learning from history is so important, yet. It seems to be that we just keep making the same mistakes over and over again, right? Um, but the strength of the labor movement and the protest movement, and my takeaway was like, how do we get labor unions and environmentalists like talking together again? I mean, I know that they are in communities, 
um, you know, by necessity, but on a, on a broad um, scope, it seems like that's kind of like the missing piece. Do you kind of feel like that as well? Like, especially after the experience of making this documentary? Absolutely. I think you definitely hit the nail on the head there. I think, and, and one of the folks in the, in the movie talks about this, Terry Steele, who's a former, um, uh, a former mine worker and is a member of the UMWA, the United Mine Workers of America. And he brings this up. He's like, environmentalists will come here and think that we don't know what climate change is, or we don't know, like, we don't understand. And this is a classic occurrence of like, you know, the well-meaning liberal or the well-meaning white person as, uh, as Martin Luther King Jr. put it, uh, coming into a place and being like, let me tell you what you don't know. And it's like, hey, why don't you shut up and listen for a second? Because I bet you they do know. Um, yeah, they're and, living it every day. Right. right. <laughs> and it's like when your choices are to either be homeless or work in a coal mine, I think the vast majority of human beings would choose to work in a coal mine. Uh, and to understand that these are, the, these are the choices facing people. It really is a mono economy. Uh, in in West Virginia, both in terms of the coal region, which is more towards the south, and in the fracking region, which is now more towards the central and north part of the state. But I think that, you know, that's a very important part. And one of the things that I was hoping to highlight with the film is like, hey, maybe if we as environmentalists would walk into these spaces and be like, hey, what do y'all need? Yeah. Like, how can we facilitate the just transition of working in a greener economy to ensure that y'all still have these well-paying you, you know, union jobs, as opposed to just walking into a space and being like, y'all are evil because you work in coal. It's like, yeah. well, you're not going to get anybody to listen to you if that's it's not a good starting point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. It's yeah. It's so interesting. Like watching the, um, like the democratic primaries for, you know, presidential season and how Pennsylvanians were talked about, like, like so pro fracking, right? Like it's interesting how the media, uh, you know, and just kind of like the party, like the democratic party and stuff, they um, just kind of throw everybody in a bucket and that's what you are. You know, you're a coal miner, uh, you're a fracker and, um, you know, there's no no gray area and there's no room there for like nuance or actual conversation. It's like, yeah. And you I, I thought like you, you did a great job in your film of highlighting that like these these folks that live in Pennsylvania or West Virginia that, you know, live with and off the land and feel very strongly about it. Um, they're not going to be pro fracking or they're not going to be pro mining, but they get lumped into that same like hillbilly category of like, oh, well, y'all are just rural idiots. You wouldn't know. I guess you vote for Trump and I guess you love poisoned water. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what have you? Like, well, that's not a great starting point. <laughs> no. So about the people um, that are that you interview um, in your film, how did you tell, walk me through a little bit of the process. So through your experiences with journalism, um, you know, and, and all the other things that you do, you decide, okay, West Virginia, I, I think this is where I'm going. I want to tell this story. I mean, kind of, kind of walk through like our listeners who are filmmakers that maybe, you know, are wanting to launch their first project, like, What's a little bit of your workflow and your timeline as far as research and outreach and, and things like that? So I actually, I, I, I was very lucky because a lot of this fell in the lap of uh, one of the people that shows up at the end of the film, Jen Deerenwater, who's an indigenous journalist. And she'd actually reached out to me about West Virginia specifically um, because she says she wanted to go home. Uh, the Southern parts of West Virginia are historically Cherokee land. And she had not been, so she wanted to go. And uh, I had been thinking about West Virginia for you know quite some time, and I just mm. thought, hey, well, this would be a nice, like, nice, uh, you know, serendipitous moment to you know split the costs and um, and have a buddy to drive down there with. Uh, so it kind of happened, um, you know, a, a, a lot in large part thanks to her. Um, and she had reached out to some folks as well. And so we kind of pooled resources there. And, you know, we've both done frontline journalism for quite some time. So between the two of us, it wasn't really that hard to, you know, reach out to a couple of people. Oh, do you know anyone? Oh, yeah, I know this great person. Oh, okay. Yeah. 
Um, and I also wanted to, I wanted to avoid trying to find too many people to start with, because I think, especially if you're trying to tell a story without like stacking it to make it to, you know, as you like it, um, then I felt that it was important to, to, to kind of meet folks when I was there as well. So once I was there and I talked to some folks, they were able to be like, oh, hey, you should talk to so-and-so. Sorry. You should talk to so-and-so um, and, you know, drive down there and he'll meet you. And, uh, you know, a couple of the people that are in the film just happened to be, you know, hanging around that day. And they said, oh, yeah, well, I have a fracking story. There's a compressor station close to where we live. And I was like, can we hang out and talk for a bit? Yeah. Um, and this, th that was also part of the thing is like, there is hardly anybody in West Virginia that hasn't been impacted either, but I mean, predominantly coal because it's been there for so long since the creation of the state. But also if you move up to the, you know, the middle or the, the, the upper parts of the state fracking is everywhere. Um, and the industry has done a really good job using the same playbook as coal used uh, to needle its way into the culture and the conscience of, uh, of, of people who live there so that they really, they don't just rely on it for money, but they kind of feel connected to it. Oh, like this is our, this is our, our energy sector, right? Like we kept the country running through coal and now we're keeping the country running through fracking. Um, that same, same trope is being reused by the oil and gas industry. Uh, so it's, it's definitely, uh, it, it, it's, it's definitely something that is hard to avoid um, when you're just wandering around there. And of course I, you know, people have brought up like, oh, well, why didn't you talk to, to the people who work in the fracking industry? And, and that's because I, we already know what the industry line is. So I don't feel the need to highlight that in a film. Right. I think what's we've, really heard, we've heard that a lot. <laughs> right. Um, just turn on any corporate media and you'll see bridge fuel um, <laughs> smattered across the, the lower third there. So I felt that it was important to hear from folks uh, who don't get their voices heard. And this was something that another person in the film highlighted, uh, Linda, I Linda Ireland, who's a former teacher, said that, you know, you really feel like no one's listening because the industry doesn't want to hear it from you. And then you go to your, your, uh, your politicians and they're bought and paid for, so they don't want to hear it either. Uh, and so she said, you know, you really feel like you're screaming into a void. And so obviously those are the voices that need to be, uh, that need to be heard. The folks who don't feel like they have, um, any agency. Yeah. It's difficult to fight against the jobs message too, right? Like that's in a lot of these places. So I'm in Erie, Pennsylvania, like Northwestern Pennsylvania, which is, uh, where we filmed. And fortunately until they start drilling like the Utica shale, like until they get that desperate, which hopefully things change before then, but there's like no Marcellus in our county. Um, but the jobs thing is, you know, when you have uh, communities that are so desperate, right, and they're struggling and it's low wages, it's not a lot of job options. Um, it seems to be that's, that's the trap is that, uh, you know, where you kind of get that sense of pride that you're talking about, like, these are jobs. These are good American jobs, you know, like hard work, grit, determination. We're fueling the nation, like everything you were just saying. It's it's a it's a tough message to compete against when, um, you know, one is giving you a paycheck and the other one is like retraining, like, you know, you know like seems like ephemeral a little bit because the messaging just isn't as strong. They haven't been around for 100 years, you know. Yeah. And I mean, I, I think it's hard too, because that's not, I think a lot of, and you know, myself included, you know, envision a world where we won't need jobs and, you know, we can sure. all follow our passions, but it's like, that can't be your messaging when you walk into a place that's, mm -hmm. you know, to been tied to the coal industry for the past hundred and something years. Um, so it's important to shift that messaging and then talk about like, you know, and 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 again, uh, so, uh, uh, someone in the film mentions this too. He's like, "You want to you want to make an environmentalist? I'll tell you how you make an environmentalist. You put five hundred coal miners at work in a sustainable plant, right?" And and he says they whip a coal miner's ass after you know a year or two. 
And that basically like that's that that's the whole point is that a lot of people, you know, I don't know anyone who wants to die of black lung. Um, but I think there's a lot of the, uh, there's a lot of cognitive distance and there's a lot of rationalization that happens. And I think a way for these people to survive has been to connect themselves with the culture of coal mining to basically make an excuse for their own mm -hmm. decimation, you know, not, not to speak of the land, but just your own personal <laughs> decimation of your body and your health. Um, so I think understanding that is really is really key and talking about it in a way that, you know, these folks, uh, th these folks aren't just being told, oh, we're going to, you know, sometime down the road, we'll figure it out. And it's like, well, what am I supposed to do in the meantime to feed mm -hmm. my kids? And uh, so I think like the the way that that we talk about it has to change. And another point that's brought up in the film is that, uh, you know, we are very strongly anti certain things. Like we're anti fracking, we're anti coal, which is great, but what are you for? Mm -hmm. You know, you have to know what you're fighting for. Otherwise you can't just be the, the antithesis of something. That's not actually a stance. So it's important to highlight what we're for. And so there are, you know, organizations that work on, you know, talking about the importance of renewable energy and talking about, hey, these mountaintops that have been decimated that you can't actually totally reclaim because you've just destroyed the ecosystem. Yeah. Um, but hey, that would be a great place for like a localized wind farm or a localized solar farm because it's like on the top of what was, once was a mountain. So let's mm -hmm. talk about like how we can shift this in, in, a, in a way that like actually seems active and proactive as opposed to, well, you know, screw coal. Okay, and like, right. what is the other part of that sentence? Right, exactly. Like we need to give people hope and we need to inspire them and feel like, um, you know, they can be part of the process and the decision making, right? Um, it's yeah, it's something uh, like the word consent, the, the concept of consent is something that um, been thinking about a lot lately because the communities uh, don't really have a say in any of these industries. Like, for example, in Erie right now, um, we're kind of being pushed through. A, there's like a plastics processing, yeah. a massive plastics processing plant um, that's being pushed through right now. And the way that we all found out was uh, a big insurance company in our region is an investor and the way it was picked up by the media was like pretty much just running press releases for this potential recycling facility and the name of the company is international recycling group it's like the most generic name and so that's one of the things we're fighting here but it's like they announced it as 50 new jobs Sure. There's going to be 50, 50 jobs and we're going to recycle. And so right away, you know, the messaging is out there. And so, yeah, it's like educating people that plastic re recycling is not really a thing. And what this plan is planning to do is flake all the useless plastic that you that's never going to be recycled, mm -hmm. ship it across Lake Erie to Canada where they're going to incinerate it and use it in the production of steel as like a Coke <laughs> alternative. It's like the worst thing ever. And it's just feeding why they're doing it, right? Is just to, so that we can keep drilling so that we can, you know, like just keep it going, keep it going. So we'll just, we'll just make more. We'll just burn it. Oh, God, it that's awful. It's, it's <laughs> awful, but it's like, you know, if, if you don't, to your point, if you don't present alternatives, if you don't involve people, if you don't do things differently than what we're all used to, right? Like having no consent, like having no say, like just this is happening. There's going to be 50 jobs. They're not going to be great for your health. They're not going to be great for the environment, but they're 50 jobs. Yeah, we need to, we need to give people hope. We need to educate people that there are alternatives, that there are other ways to think about industry. Cinema Activist is produced by Lion's Den Productions. Hosted by John C. Lyons. Music by Tony Gray. Support the efforts of Lion's Den Productions by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash Lion's Den Productions. Thank you for listening. We'll be back soon.